some reason, every time I get my elbow, my mouth opens here, and I'm going to remember how it works because it does. And uh, everybody likes to get around the supper table. And the Bible tells us there's going to be a grand feast. Marriage feast is referred to as well. The marriage supper of the Lamb. And let's ask the Lord just to make this real to us today. And we've already been blessed with the worship time of giving our song of praise to them. Father, thank you for your blessings upon us today. Do bless us. Do bless everyone that is not with us today, especially Ray, touch him in his body and heal him. Heal him in his body. Father, he is a vital, important part of this ministry. And Father, we, we need, and he needs, a touch. And we ask you to touch him in his body and make him well. Thank you, Lord, for answering this prayer. Thank you, Lord. RSVP only. For real. To this particular supper. Can you think back at some gatherings, family gatherings? I know when Joan's mama was living, she was a real cook. She, was a, she really loved, I think she loved having people over. Uh, Joan and her mom and family lived in Lakeland, Florida, just a few miles from Southeastern Concord University now. You found your way over there. I found my way over there, buddy. <laughs> All because she was serving fat back and food. Oh, yeah. yeah. That stuff was good, man. I didn't know why. But it seemed like it was good, and I just did. My body craves fat to this day. But anyway. That's not good, but that's what happened back then. But she loved to have people over. She just loved them. They don't tell how many people she had over to feed. How she had a house full of people all the time. I don't know how she made a food budget work feeding all those southeastern people, but she did somehow. But uh, she'd rather feed people than buy a new couch. That was her way of doing things, opening her home and putting people's feet under her table, blessing people with uh, good homemade biscuits and food. And um, just so great. But we as believers have something to look forward to. It's amazing how the, the Lord spoke so much about suffering. And we'll get into that in a little bit. But he prepared us. He was preparing. Even when he walked on this earth, he was preparing everybody for the grand supper of all suppers that are going to be. Revelation 19.9 says blessed, honored, blessed and honored are those who are called or invited in the Greek. It can be either one. Called or invited unto the merry supper of the Lamb. I'm very glad that we have already turned in our RSVP and we said we're going to be there. We've already made reservations. We've been invited and we have took the Lord up on his invitation. I sort of did a countdown. I, I call it a countdown to supper. You got the rapture of the church. You got the tribulation such as the world has never known before. The man of sin, the lawless one, is revealed. Isn't it amazing? The lawlessness is already forerunning what his revelation will be. We live in a time of unbelievable lawlessness. Mass martyrdom on an unprecedented scale. There will be a lot of people who will make it to the supper but they'll make it there by martyrdom. They will actually have to give their lives, especially during the tribulation period. And the Bible gives us, and we've been studying, there'll be a good number of those people that will be resurrected in the middle of the tribulation period. And John says, who are these people? And he goes on to explain. So there'll be mass martyrdom, unprecedented. 
And then the 21 judgment, this is kind of just a gist of what's, not everything, but kind of the rapture, the tribulation, the man of sin is revealed during that time, the mass martyrdom, 21 judgments of God's wrath poured out on the earth, the great overthrow, of the great harlot, and the great overthrow of mystery Babylon, and the second coming of Christ. But first, you've got to have the supper. You got to have the, the the marriage consummated. You got to have the supper feast. Amen. The marriage supper, a celebration of Christ's union with His bride, the church. The term bride implies wife. That's right. You'll make a good wife, people. Indicating that the church has already, at this time with the supper, has already experienced an intimate, loving relationship with Christ. How many are glad you've already fallen in love with Christ? Yes. Amen. And then after the marriage supper, we have the second coming of Christ. With him we come, and Satan is defeated and bound. Armageddon done. I asked Jonas, what's best? Done or what's the best word? Done. It's over. <laughs> it's done. The great supper of our God, which is actually, we should have probably put the great supper of our God is the official term for that. And that's another supper. But I ain't the one you want to be at that supper. That's going to be a pretty bad supper. That's a supper with, for, for the birds to eat up all the the bodies that are left with the massacre of Armageddon being done. The Bible calls it the great supper of God, which is, he's going to call all the vultures from all over the world, and they will feast on those that are left in the battle of Armageddon in the fields. The supper is only for those with Clean hands and pure heart. I mean, times that your mom was there. Clean your hands before you come to the table. <laughs> Heard my little boy. Mama could not get him to clean his hands. Could not get him to do personal hygiene to save her life. She worked on him so hard. I may have told her this, I don't know, but she didn't hear it again anyway. She could not get that 11 year old boy to. She'd have to check him before he came to the table. Well, let me see your hands. And he'd have you a half job, you know. Wouldn't brush his teeth, wouldn't bathe himself the way she asked him to. She screamed and hollered and pulled out everything she had to do, trying to get him to do right. Couldn't get him to do nothing right. Couldn't get him to take care of himself. Then all of a sudden, he turned 12 and a half or 13, and a little girl moved in two doors down. Now, she hadn't done nothing for him. She just moved in. That's all she done. He hadn't even met her. He don't even know her name yet. But now he's washing his hands till his skin comes off. He's brushing his teeth to the enamel about falls off. And his mama, who's got stretch marks from him, who birthed him, who changed his poo-poo diaper and did all that, couldn't get him to do nothing. But this little girl, who he, this little girl, he don't even know who she is. But it was just a sequence of events. He turned the right age at the right moment that she moved in, and now he'll just do it all. It's called motivation. Right? I'm very glad that God gives us motivation. He by the Holy Ghost and the Holy Spirit, He moves on us. He motivates us. We are moved by the Spirit. When I start leading the worship today, all of a sudden, I mean, I'm up here trying to lead and trying to pay attention to what I'm doing, trying to listen to Joan, play the notes. But all of a sudden, I'm caught up in worship because the Holy Spirit comes on us. He just comes on us as we are worshiping, doesn't He? And that moves us towards God. It moves us. After the wedding, it's customary for the 
bride and groom, usually sometimes they'll change their clothes because they're going on a trip. You wait to see this trip, what's going to happen with this wedding thing? It's going to be something, man. You talk about that <laughs> interesting thing. Look on the other side of your sheet there. The marriage supper of the Lamb. Described in Revelation 19, 7 through 10. Joe, could you read that for me? You got your Bible? I'm working hard today. I'm sorry. I'm picking on you because I uh, need your help today. I'm doing double duty with the worship and both. The marriage of the Lamb, the marriage supper of the Lamb, 19, 7 through 10.
bridegrooms and the parable of the marriage of the king's son. The most important people in the marriage ceremony is the bride and the bridegroom. One of the things that I, when I do a wedding, I, I, I disturb some family members every now and then because I have a bride sitting here and the groom maybe and the parents somewhere. And I, so I start off when I do the to practice, you know, the night before or the time before, I would say, now listen, this is her wedding, and it, whatever she wants to do in her wedding, that's her prerogative, as long as it's not immoral or illegal. If she wants to come down on, on roller skates, that's her prerogative. And so I kind of bust that little balloon of all these parents wanting to do, redo their wedding, and do it through her. <laughs> Let her have her own wedding for heaven's sake, right? And I, I said, these are the important people. She, the bride is the important person. The groom is the important person. And we can't take the analogy totally for what we're looking at today, but listen, these are the people that are important in the marriage ceremony. And in the Gospel of John, chapter 1, 29, John makes it clear. He, he makes it clear. He said, Christ is the bridegroom and the Lamb. Behold the Lamb of God which takes away the sins of the world. John proclaims that. He makes it clear. In John 3, 29, it's not listed on your sheet. He, John said he was a friend of the bridegroom. John the Baptist says, I'm not the Christ. John the Baptist says, I'm not the Christ. And he referred to Christ as the bridegroom. Behold, he's the Lamb. He's the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Who is the bridegroom? It is Christ. Who is the bride? That's a very important question. Who is the bride? Of Christ. The Apostle Paul makes it clear in 2 Corinthians 11 2. He says, I am jealous over you with glad, godly jealousy. For I have espoused you to one husband, that I may present you as a virgin to Christ. In Ephesians 5 32, Paul, speaking of husbands and wives and their relationship together, likens the husband to Christ and the wife to the church. What a great mystery! Christ and the church. Christ and the church. The church being the bride of Christ. When and where will this marriage supper take place? The marriage of the Lamb or the marriage supper must take place in heaven. I think when you remember hearing what Joe read this morning, okay, we have the bride who's dressed in white linen. Do you know what's already taking place? The, re the judgment seat of Christ has already happened. The rewards have already been given out. The, the, the garment has been given to the bride to wear. And now it's time for the wedding feast. We're at that point. And this is going to take place towards the end of the tribulation, which is taking place on earth at the same time. Right after the judgment seat of Christ or the judgments of reward, 2 Corinthians 5.10, you may want to put a note, note of that. You can note that there, 2 Corinthians 5.10. Right before the second coming of Christ and the defeat of the Antichrist. The, the bride is presented in Ephesians 5.27. Gives us the manner in which the bride will be presented. And it says it this way, that he might present to himself a glorious church, not having spot nor wrinkle, holy without blemish. We are the church. We are the bride of Christ. Amen? And we will be presented as such. The marriage supper of the Lamb or also called the marriage feast of the Lamb. Now, this is important to differentiate between those who are guests, those who are spectators, and the bride. You have the bride, which is the church, right? You have the guests, 
And you have the spectators. Let me tell you who the spectators are at the wedding summer. It's the angels. The angels are the spectators. They know nothing about redemption. They know nothing about the blood of the Lamb and the cleansing that we experience through redemption of Christ's death and resurrection. They don't know anything about that. So they're spectators at the, perhaps, at the wedding feast. And then all the people who died from Adam on to the resurrection, what are they? They're not the church, right? Are you following now? All the people who died, who believed and put their trust in God, from Adam all the way in the Old Testament, through the Old Testament, to the resurrection of Christ, the cross and the resurrection. They're not the church. They're saints from the Old Testament. They're in heaven. They want to receive their rewards. The saints of the Old Testament are the guests. At the wedding feast. But you and I are the honored guests. We are the bride of Christ. The Old Testament saints are guests. The angels perhaps will be spectators. But we as the church are the true bride of Christ. what you were reading there in chapter 19. Yeah. I remember one wedding that a girl lady in my church, my home church, my father was a pastor. This was so great. You know how people do little things to the bride and groom as they're fixing to go, mess up their cars or do all kind of stuff. Well, this was unique. This, this, this couple that got married, they were kind of interesting people to say the least. But anyway, I won't go into that too much. But they were just interesting, unusual kind of a couple. Somebody had gone to the, their car, they were going to go on their honeymoon, and jacked it up, Jerry, and put blocks into the back of this so it couldn't go. And they got in the car, and they were waving at everybody, we're on our way to do the honeymoon, man! And they cranked it up and it just sit there and spin. It wouldn't go nowhere. John, and I, I never will forget, I was there in Washington. And that, that bride, she said, Come on, Woofy! His name was Woofy Barber. Come on, Woofy, we gotta get going, man! She wanted to get the thing going. And poor guy was struggling, trying to get the car to move. And it was, the engine was sound, the, the wheels were moving, but it, the car wasn't going anywhere. I've seen a lot of funny things to do with weddings, probably a hundred plus over the years. But I have never heard of a honeymoon thing like this. He's fixing to read it. And you have a wedding feast, and then you go, and then look at it, Joe, and then the heavens open. Now, they, they didn't change their, they're changing their clothes. Now, Jesus looks a little different now when he gets on the white horse, right, Joe? It's three real loud with passion, Joe. Well, right after you read what you read. Then I saw an angel standing in the sun. He called out in a loud voice, saying, All the birds flying overhead, come, gather together the great supper of God, so that you may eat the flesh of kings, the flesh of military commanders, the flesh of mighty, and the flesh of horses and of your riders, and the flesh of everyone, both free and slaves, all in great. Then I saw the beast, the kings of the earth, and their armies gathered together to wage war against the rider on the horse, and against his army. And the beast was taken prisoner, along with it the false prophet, who had performed the signs in his presence. He deceived those who accepted the mark of the beast and those who worshiped its image with these signs. Okay, now you read about the bird feast, which we, that's good. 
What, what, what verse 11 of 19, does that have the heavens opening? Then I saw heaven open, and there was a white horse, its rider called Faithful and True. He judges and makes war with justice. His eyes were like a fiery flame, and many crowns were on his head. He had a name written that no one knows except himself. He wore a robe dripped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. The armies that were in heaven followed him on white horses, wearing pure white linen, a sharp sword. sword came from his mouth so that he might strike the nations with it. He will rule them with the rod of iron. Amen. That's good, Joe. You have the wedding feast. You have the birds feasting. But before the birds feast, you have Christ mounting the white horse and the armies with him, which is the church, which is the saints. Now, think about this. You have the wedding feast, and then it's time to mount up on the horses. We're going to go for a ride. How many of you know that that's what the saints are going to do with Christ after the marriage supper of the Lamb? We're going to ride with Christ. And you said, I saw 10,000 times 10,000 of the saints with him in the clouds. People, this, I know it sounds very hard to get your mind around it, but that will be the beginning or the, the beginning of the thousand years of reign with Christ. Amen. I mean, thanks to this supper is going to be a very exciting supper. We just got to get ready for the summer. I heard about a, a survey was done about uh, the most comforting words that people have ever heard in their journey of faith. And thousands of people responded to that survey. Thousands. And, and the most comforting, number one, was, I love you. How many of you ever been comforted by that? The second most response of the thousands that responded to this of the most comforting words, the first one was, I love you. The second one was, I forgive you. I mean, they're in recovery because you either forgave someone or they forgave you. Huh? The third one is so crazy. This is now this is people sit this in. Thousands of people sit this in. The most comforting words in your journey of life. Number one, I love you. Number two, I forgive you. The third response of the most comforting words from the top down, summer ready. People. Now that's what people responded to. Thousands of people took this survey. Listen, we need to get excited because there's going to be a marriage and you're in it. And there's going to be a wedding feast. You're in it. I want to tell you, he's getting the supper on the table. Supper's getting close. Time to get excited. Soon and very soon, George, we're going to see the king. Let's stand together. Amen. Because he lives, amen, we can, we can deal with the crazy stuff down here. Uh, we can face every day. Can we? Because he lives, he says, chill out, I've overcome the world. That's what he told us. He said, chill out. Don't, don't get blown out.
because we're living to live again. Did you hear that message we heard at your father's? We're living to live again. Amen. Let's sing it one more time before we have our closing prayer. Because He lives, I can face tomorrow. Because He lives, all fear is gone.